let's have a look at this together. Um, and you've made some progress, which is great. What I'm going to do is I will see if you're on the right track and you can compare with me if you're like, okay, I think I know what's going on. But in addition to, I've got the right answer and I know what it looks like as well, because the ultimate thing we're going to do here is graph, which I should write down and you should too. Um, the ultimate thing is, in extension to complex numbers, I think it's really easy just to kind of do, just go through the process. And you're like, you're really good at algebra now, which is going to be a major component of how we solve this. But because you're so good at algebra, you can often sort of fall into the trap of not knowing why you're doing what you're doing and not knowing like what's, what's this result at the end mean in relation to this. So I'm not just going to show you the answer. I, I also want to tease out some of why it is what it is. Okay. Now, very broadly speaking, there are two kinds of graphs that you'll encounter within complex numbers on the argand diagram, on the argand plane. The two kinds are, number one, you know those ones where you see something like, say, arg z is greater than pi on 2, and, you know, sorry, yeah, greater than pi on 2, and I put my inequalities the other way. Let's make it less than, and between pi and 4. Right? So you've got some complex number, and when you measure its primary argument right, from our positive real axis, um, it's going to be between pi and 4 and pi and 2. So you know there's that sector that you end up getting. Right? Um, I could say, you know, how about mod z is just going to be less than 3. Okay, so we're going to get what shape out of that? That's a circle because we're just looking for the distance from the origin and make sure it's less than whatever is set, right? So there's a whole bunch that you have to think of them in terms of just the complex numbers. But then there's those other kinds which essentially become a Cartesian graph, right? We're going to resolve these guys because we're like, I don't, I don't know what happens when you geometrically square the conjugate of a number and subtract that from. Like, I don't even know what that looks like in a ready way. I need to actually dig into the algebraic weeds and then try to find my way through there and get this in all x's and y's. Okay? So that's just to say, okay, we're cleaning, clearly leaning towards this family of functions. And so what are we going to do here? You actually need to state something right out the gate before you can even begin. You have to introduce some variables, right? What would you like to introduce? I'm going to start with let z equal x plus i y will be perfect, right? This is that Cartesian leaning. I mean, you could have said a plus i b, but then you're going to have an a axis and a b axis, which just don't fit our brain as nice and neatly. So I'm going to introduce that. And that means that I can now express everything that I have here in terms of my x's and my y's. And I wonder how you went with this. I'm going to get my, uh, I'm actually going to go straight to squaring it because I think you know this well enough, right? If I've got my x plus i y in here and then I square, I'm going to get my x squared piece. I'm going to get my middle piece. And then when I do my i y squared, or i y squared, what am I going to get when I resolve that? Minus y squared, very good. Okay, so there's my expansion of just that number, and that's something which we want to become reasonably comfortable with doing. Then we're going to subtract, okay, now. Because this is the conjugate, right? We're doing all the same things. So is this x squared going to be any different? Nope. Same deal. All right, this guy, how will this be different? Just a minus because I'm going to have minus i y multiplying in there. Minus. What about this piece? Is this going to be plus? Hmm. Think, think. Let's just, if whenever you're like, oh, now I'm not sure, then you go back. I mean, you don't want to waste time doing extra algebraic expansions that you don't need to. But if you do need to, then do it, right? If I've got z bar, x minus i, y, let's do the squaring now, right? This whole thing gets squared. So I had my x squared. I had my minus 2xy, which you were happy with before. If you had a minus b all squared, then this last piece, right, is going to be still plus i y squared, because the minus also gets squared. Is that OK? Uh, this minus that we had here came from the i's, and that hasn't gone anywhere. So I'm still going to write, oh, wrong color, minus y squared. Is that OK? And you can see clearly a whole bunch of things are going to collapse here. That's why we like conjugates, because they fit so nicely together. Finish my modulus sign there, and it's going to be greater than or equal to 16. All right. Now, because we did it in this way, you can see the bits that are going to be nice and neat and going to fall out. Tell me what's going to cancel. First thing? Great. They're gone. By the way, I'm doing this very deliberately. When you've got a lot of terms to cancel, either by subtraction or by like fractions and that kind of thing, I encourage you to do it like this. You know, if you've only got one other color with you, rather than like actually crossing out the thing, we look at your working, right? And it becomes harder to read, even if we know what you're doing, if you've just like scribbled out things on top of it. So this does the same purpose. You can still see those are aligned. What else cancels? 
Yeah, so I've got a minus y squared there and a minus y squared there. And that's exactly how I'll write it so that I can see the difference. Okay. So that's really good. That leaves me with, okay, what have I got here? 4 i x y. Are you okay with that? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Now, I'm going to come to that i in a second. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with him briefly. Um, I'm going to deal with my real numbers here because they're nice and easy and they're positive as well. So I'm going to divide through by 4, which gives me this. And now I want you to pause, okay? Because see, you got very close to this, but there's a subtle difference, and I wonder if you've worked it out yet, because you're working so close, but not quite. We need to think about this quite carefully, okay? If I gave you something like, say, the absolute value of 5a, if we were just, you know, two unit students, and we were living in real number land, we could really comfortably say, this is just 5 times the absolute value of a. In fact, that's kind of what we did here when we divided through by 4. We factorized out the 4, we divided through, we just did it all in one hit. Okay? But you have to be super careful dealing with complex numbers. You've already learned, hopefully, you know this rule? This rule here that we've been using for ages with just normal real numbers? Are you guys familiar with what happens to this in complex number land? Have you encountered this before? If you haven't, tell me no, because then I'll explain it. But if you have, I don't want to bore you. So is it something you've met before? I saw your video on it. Okay, so you know, so you got it from me. How about you guys? Has it been addressed in class? Okay, so let me just mention this, right? This is something we know what to do with. If, for example, I gave you um, the square root of 60, which is not square, right? But we can see square numbers in there. So you guys should reflexively say the biggest square that I can pull out of this is? I think it's going to be 4. Yeah, so you'd say, okay, that's the square root of 4 times the square root of 15, which gives you this, right? And that's like a big part of all we want you to do when we introduce thirds for the first time is do a whole bunch of simplifying just like this, okay? This is fine, this is fine in real numbers, okay? Everything looks happy there. But the second you, the second you enter the complex set, you run into troubles. For example, what happens if both a and b are just negative 1, okay? Hmm. Now, if we're in complex number land, right, we have a name for, for the square root of negative 1, we call it. It is the basic building block, right? So you should be able to tell me, we just did i squared over there, the answer of course is minus 1, okay? But if I use this rule, which you've relied on very faithfully for many years now, and see what happens if I try and draw an equality here, so it's a really bad multiplication sign, that's better. Have you noticed what happens, right? This is my square root of ab. Negative 1 times negative 1, of course, is just 1. You're like, whoa, -oh. what happened? And the answer is, this rule actually only works when a and b are both strictly positive. If we are willing to deal with complex numbers, suddenly things break down. By the way, just for extra bonus points, um, I think it's probably not until you haven't done inverse functions as a topic yet, have you? No, not yet. You will encounter that next year so that you can do inverse trig and what have you. And the, part of the reason why this is a problem is because the square root function, right? It's an inverse function with a restricted domain. We restrict it to the positives. Quick question for you. Why do we restrict it to the positives? Why don't we let, like, give me a word definition, a verbal definition of the square root of something is, how would you define that? Hmm. Yep. Yeah. Let me say that again, see if I got that right, and see if you guys agree. The square root of something is the number that if you multiply it by itself, you'll get your number, right? Doesn't that fit this? Isn't negative 1, by that definition, one of the square roots of 1? Because if you multiply this by itself, sure enough, you get there, right? But instead, we restrict the domain because when was the first time we really needed square roots, like to actually use it in problems? It was with a particular kind of shape. These guys, right? You learned Pythagoras' theorem, and then all of a sudden you're like, ooh, I've got to find out, you know, to find out the hypotenuse, right? But this is a length. In lengths, then positive things are the only thing that's, that makes sense. Does that make sense? But it causes a problem in here. You don't have triangles with like, ooh, let's, let's make that imaginary units, right? So that's why there is a restriction. It solves a problem for us, but it creates other ones you have to be careful with.